We believe that God is the good and eternal creator of all things, seen and unseen, and that he has spoken authoritatively to us through his written word. We believe that every single human being is made by God and for God and therefore is important to God, no exceptions. We also believe that every human being is sinful and broken, that even the best of us have deep rooted evil in our hearts that comes out in all sorts of ugly ways in our actions, in our words, in our attitudes, no exceptions there either. We also believe that God was unwilling to let our sins have the final say over our eternity. And so he became a man in the person of Jesus Christ to save us and to open the eyes of our darkened hearts. We believe that Jesus didn't just perform miracles and love people and live a sinless life. And he didn't even just die on the cross, but actually three days later, he literally and physically rose from the dead to prove his power over sin and death and hell and to offer to every single person in this room eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. That's what we believe. We believe that through Jesus, yes, we get heaven later, but right now, we get power and purpose and comfort and guidance and a family of faith to lean on for the rest of our life, starting right now. You cannot earn the grace of God by your good works and you cannot lose it because of your bad ones. Otherwise it would not be grace. No one is so good they don't need grace. No one is so bad they can't have it. But even in this very moment, the arms of Jesus Christ, the resurrected King, are open to you. For anyone who would reach up to him and stand on his gospel. That's what we believe. Believe the good news. Jesus Christ has risen. He is alive. And we are here only because of him. Let's stand and give him praise.
heavens and declare the earth, declare the glory of God. And we know, we are promised that someday our Lord returns and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. But we don't wait for that. We declare it now because there is only one tomb that is empty. Before Jesus' resurrection, other people came back to life. Lazarus came back to life. But Jesus was the one who brought him back. No one but Christ came alive of his own accord. Only God holds the power of life and death in his hands. And he holds your life and your death in his hands. And he said, those who believe in me, who are my children, no one can snatch away. You are safe and secure in the hands of God. To him be the glory. Great things he has done and great things he will do.
very special music. So I'm going to ask the girls to come, and they're going to lead us in song today or sing for us.
Good morning and welcome on this uh, Easter Sunday morning where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, I have a few announcements. you, but there is something about a countdown. I can remember growing up as a young boy uh, with the family all crowded around. Some of you probably have the same image crowded around that old black and white television set as the camera was focused on the launch pad at Cape Canaveral in Florida. We are T minus 10 seconds, the voice would come on and counting 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition, blast off. And then as the rocket rose in the air and began to climb, normally that reserve Walter Cronkite would say, go baby, as it flew. Today we can go back to uh, look at the final 94 hours that led to the empty tomb. There are 94 hours that changed the world as we would, well, it made the world as we know it today. Our countdown starts at T minus 94. If we want to, we would follow uh, Jesus through the Last Supper and the Garden of Gethsemane and, uh, and then the examination, his trial, his torture. He hung on a cross for six hours. And then he died. His body was lovingly removed 
taken down from the cross and placed in a tomb. He was there for three days and three nights. And then on the first Easter Sunday morning, the countdown continued. T minus five seconds and counting. Four, three, two, one. It was ignition, liftoff. He is risen. He is risen indeed, right? Christ the Lord has risen. And Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, the Son of God. And in Matthew chapter 12, the Jewish leaders asked him to give some kind of sign that he was the Son of God. They wanted, of course, a miracle right there on the spot to prove his divinity. He said, okay, you want a sign? Here's the sign. It's the sign of Jonah. He said, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for miraculous signs, but none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That rebellious prophet Jonah practically was dead in the belly of the fish, but then he got right with God. You might want to read that story too. And God directed that fish to just spit him out. I could use some really neat words there, but I won't gross out today. Uh, Jonah right out on the shore, and I'm sure as Jonah hit the shore, he, he hit that sh- ground running to Nineveh. Well, Jesus predicted that after his death, he would spend the same amount of time in the grave. But then God would blast him out. Blast him out of the tomb. Alive. Alive, people. He would be more alive than Jonah. Jesus came forth alive forevermore. All four gospel writers describe the resurrection morning, and each one provides uh, different details. But we're going to look at John's account, starting at John 20, verse 1 this morning. It says this, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now notice, She didn't yet believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. She thought the body had been taken away. Somebody had stolen or moved it. Then John and Peter, of course, they run to the tomb, look inside, and they were confused as well. So let's pick this up at verse 10 of chapter 20. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out and Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to my father. 
Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. Just picture what her face must have been like. She told them he had said these things to her. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, as we look to your word today, and as we look to the three questions that we need to have answers for, Father, guide us through it. And may we learn the answers. May we have the right answers to your questions. Father God, I pray the words that I speak would be the words that you would have me to speak and not of my choosing, but of your choosing. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now I'm about to give you four characters from a television show. And then I'm going to ask you to name the show. So don't tell me the show before I give you the four characters because you're going to know the show right after as I give them. Ready? Bert and Ernie, the Cookie Monster, and Kermit the Frog. What's the show? Sesame Street. Sesame Street. And those are the Muppets. But one of the earliest humans on the show, human characters on the show, was a man named Mr. Hooper. Do any of you remember Mr. Hooper? His name was Will Lee, and he was on Sesame Street for 13 years before he died of a heart attack in 1982. Now, the producers of Sesame Street were faced with a dilemma. How were they going to explain the death to 10 million children who watched the show at the time? They could have concocted some sort of story that Mr. Hooper had gone off and retired in in Florida, but instead they decided they would tell the children he died. Because this was, of course, public television, they didn't want to mention any religious or or anything spiritual. So on the day of the show, Big Bird, of course, walks out and said he had a drawing to give Mr. Hooper and said, I can't wait to see Mr. Hooper again. Then the cast member said, remember, Big Bird, we told you Mr. Hooper died. And Big Bird said, oh, yeah, I forgot. Well, I'll give it to him when he gets back. The cast member wrapped her arms around Big Bird and said, Big Bird, Mr. Hooper isn't coming back. Why not? Big Bird asked innocently. Another cast member said, Big Bird, when people die, they don't come back. The gospel of Sesame Street. It isn't good news at all, is it? What a sad message that it taught the children at that time. When people die, they don't come back. But that's not the Easter message, is it? That's not the Easter message. The good news of Easter is that because Jesus came back from death, we will live after death. Mary Magdalene was an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. She was the last person, uh, one of the last people at the cross and the first one at the tomb. She had to answer three Easter questions on that day. And these are the same three questions each one of us must answer to today. The first has to do with Easter sorrow. Why are you crying? After the two disciples returned home, Mary ventured a look inside the tomb and saw these angels And the angels asked her, woman, why are you crying? You can tell these angels, of course, never took a course in in Christian counseling because you're never supposed to ask anybody why they're crying. Why is too threatening and not supportive enough? 
considered when the husband asks his wife, why are you crying, and doesn't understand why it, the question gets her crying all the more. Because not too many of us husbands have taken Christian counseling either, uh, how to counsel. To her credit, though, Mary didn't respond to the angel by saying, how dare you ask me that question? Can't you see what I'm going through? Instead, she simply said, they've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've taken him. And then Mary, of course, we, from Scripture, she turns around and saw a man that she assumed was the gardener. That makes some sense because the Bible says that the tomb was carved out of limestone, cliffed inside of a garden. We also know this tomb belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, who was a wealthy man, who was uh, a secret follower of Jesus. It was a new tomb in which no corpse had ever been placed. This stranger asked the same question in the angel, that the angels had asked. He says, woman, why are you crying? The term here, woman, isn't rude but is the equivalent of one of us asking, ma'am, why are you crying? The angels asked the question out of curiosity, I'm sure. They probably thought this earth creature should know that Jesus is alive. So why is she crying? Jesus asked the question out of compassion. He loved Mary, and his heart was moved by Mary's tears. Why are you crying? He knew the answer, but he wanted her to say it. And she answered honestly, they've taken away my Lord away, and I don't know where he is. She didn't say nothing. I'm fine. See, that's a question Jesus asked you, us today. Why are you crying? You need to be honest with him. Don't just sniff and say nothing. I'm okay. He already knows why you're crying. He just wants you to admit the point of your pain. There could be as many different answers to that question, though, as there are people in this congregation or listening to us on Facebook today. Even for those of us who know the Lord, tears are part of our existence. As Horatio Spafford penned in his famous hymn, there are times when sorrows like sea billows roll. What are you going through right now that is causing you pain and sorrow? Mary isn't the only one who has stood in a cemetery battling tears. You still may be stinging from the death of a loved one. You may be hurting because of a recent diagnosis you or someone you love has received. Your eyes may be filled with tears because of problems with your children. The list is endless. But you know what? Jesus sees your pain and cares about your suffering. The Bible says he is our high priest who is touched by the feelings of our weakness. We learn our greatest lessons during these times of sorrow. A poem often quoted says this, I walked a mile with laughter. She chatted all the way, but as I was none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, not a word, said she, but all oh, the things I learned when sorrow walked with me. That's the first question. The second question is concerning Easter seeking. For whom or what are you searching for? This next question Jesus asked was, who are you looking for? He says to her. 
When Jesus asked Mary, her answer showed the deep love she had for Jesus. She still didn't recognize Jesus here. She thought he was the gardener. So she said, sir, if you have carried him away, please show me where you have put him and I will get him. That's love, people. Maybe Mary weighed all of 110 pounds. Let's assume Jesus weighed 165 pounds when he died. And John tells us that Nicodemus and Joseph had wrapped his body in 75 additional pounds of aloe and spice. So this little woman was going to heft his 250-pound corpse over her shoulders and carry him back inside the tomb. That's love, people. Her hope was shattered and her faith was absent, but love was still here. Remember among faith, hope, and love that the greatest of these is what? Love. Love is the greatest. And at that point, Jesus couldn't conceal himself any longer. He simply spoke her name in Aramaic. He said, Miriam, and she fell at his feet and answered his question, his second question, who are you looking for? She was looking for Jesus, and she had found him. Jesus knows your name too. He knows everything there is to know about you. You easily could imagine him calling your name right now. He could say Olive or Les or Brad. Who or what are you looking for? What is your goal in life? Everybody is looking for someone or something. They're searching for truth, purpose, that one secret that that will make their lives better. One of the great lines from the movie City Slickers is where Jack Palance says to Billy Crystal, Do you know what the secret of life is? And he holds up one finger. And this, Billy says, your finger. And Palin says, one thing. Just one thing. You stick to that one, and the rest don't mean bleep. And he rides off. And Billy shouts, but what is the one thing? And Palin says, that's what you have to find out. See, all of us are looking. We're looking for the newest, the biggest, the greatest, the next big thing. They think uh, people in life think today that, that life is all about accumulating more and more and more wealth. Or they think life is about experiencing the greatest of thrills. Many people spend their entire life scrambling up the ladder of success only to get to the top and realize that it's leaning against the wrong wall. You know, Solomon was the wisest man beside Jesus who ever lived. He once wrote, there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. Mary knew the one thing was Jesus. Jesus is the one thing. In Luke 10, Jesus is at the home of another Mary and her sister Martha. And he said to the frantic, angry Martha, you are worried and anxious about many things. But Mary has found the one thing that won't be taken from her. Mary had been seated at Jesus' feet, listening to him. A relationship with Jesus is the one thing that will give your life meaning, people. Many of us came to Christ from a Christian family. It was neat, clean, and logical. Yet even for people who come from messy past, Jesus is the answer. Mary Magdalene had to battle seven demonic appetites, and she changed her. Jesus changed her. 
I recently read another testimony by a woman named Anne Lamott, uh, her book, Grace Eventually. She says she didn't come to Jesus by a leap of faith. Instead, it evolved several misguided staggers to God. I just want to read to you part of her testimony. On the seventh night after my abortion, I discovered that I was bleeding heavily, and I thought I should call a doctor, but I was so disgusted that I had gotten so drunk one, that one, <laughs> drunk one week after my abortion that I just couldn't wake up someone to help me. I got in bed shaky and sad and too wild to have another drink or take a sleeping pill. After a while, as I lay there, I became aware of someone with me hunkered down in the corner. The feeling was so strong that I actually turned on the light for a moment to make sure no one was there. Of course, there there wasn't. But after a while in the dark again, I knew beyond doubt that it was Jesus. I felt him as surely as I feel my dog lying near my feet as I write this. I was appalled. I thought about my life and my brilliant, hilarious, progressive friends. I thought about what everyone would think of me uh, if I became a Christian. And it seemed an utterly impossible thing that simply could not be allowed to happen. So I turned to the wall and said out loud, I would rather die. I felt him just sitting there watching me with patience and love. I squeezed my eyes shut, but it didn't help because it wasn't my eyes that were seeing him. I finally fell asleep, and in the morning he was gone. The experience spooked me badly. And everywhere I went, I felt as if there was this little cat following me, waiting for me to reach down and and to pick it up, waiting, wanting me to, to open the door and let it in. And when you let a cat in and feed it a little bit of milk, it stays forever. A lot of you have discovered that, I'm sure. One week later, I went to church, she writes. I was so hungover, I couldn't stand for the songs. The time I stayed for the sermon, though, I thought it was ridiculous, like someone trying to convince me of the existence of extraterrestrials. But the last song was so deep and raw and pure that I could not escape. I felt as though the presence of God was washing over me, And I began to cry, and I raced home and felt that little cat running along at my heels. I opened the door of my house, and I stood there for one long minute. And then I hung my head and said, I quit. I took a deep, long breath and said out loud, all right, you can come in. She found whom and what she was looking for. The question for you today is, have you? The next question deals with Easter surrender. Will you fall before Jesus as your living Lord? Jesus could conceal his identity any longer. When he saw the love of Mary professed, he simply spoke her name, Mary, or in Aramaic, Miriam. When she heard her name spoken by Jesus, Mary realized it was the Lord. And in her despair, it was turned to delight. She could only utter one word, Rabboni, The word literally means master, teacher. She declared Jesus to be her master. And then she fell at his feet and began to worship him. That's why Jesus said, don't hold on to me. He had something for her to do. 
He said, go tell my disciples that I am alive. And this scenario, of course, is confirmed when you combine all of the four gospel accounts. We learn that Mary Magdalene wasn't alone that morning. Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, was there as well. The Bible says, so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Have you fallen on your knees and declared Jesus to be your Lord? You may consider yourself today a bit of a skeptic. There was a skeptic among the disciples. On that first Easter evening, Jesus showed up among the disciples, but we know Thomas was missing. And when he returned, they told him the good news that Jesus was alive, but Thomas was a skeptic. And he said, yeah, right. I won't believe that story until I can place my fingers and my, uh, in the nail prints in his hands. Now be careful what you ask for, Thomas. Because one week later, boom, Jesus showed up again. There is a painting that was done by a famous artist. It is of Jesus pulling Thomas, Thomas's arm toward the gaping wound in his side. But we know what happened because the Bible says a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Could you make that same confession? Would you make that same confession? Will you fall before the Lord and confess him as your living Lord and Savior? There was Easter sorrow followed by Easter seeking that led to Easter surrender. Here's another question for you to consider. Do you know for certain you will go to heaven when you die? Most people believe, well, if they're good enough, that you can earn your way to heaven. The New York Times in an interview with uh, former New York mayor, uh, Michael Bloomberg, and he was talking about all the work he had done on gun control and battles for obesity and stuff like that. And then he said, I'm telling you, if there is a God, when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. I'm heading straight in. I've earned my place in heaven. It's not even close. I hope that makes you cringe because it makes me cringe when I read that. Those words, because you know why? Because one of Satan's most popular lies is that you can be good enough to earn your way into heaven. People, there is only one way to heaven. And that is when you fall before Jesus and you confess him as your living Lord. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Why doesn't the Bible say confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that he fed the 5,000? Or confess Jesus is Lord and believe he walked on water. Why doesn't it say that? Because the resurrection isn't just a miracle, people. It is the very sign that Jesus is really who he said he was. It is the signature on his claim. You know, I recently read a story while putting this together about a Muslim 
who had become a Christian. He said, I, I was looking at the lies of Muhammad and Jesus. And he says, then I came to a fork in the road. One led to death and a tomb in Medina. The other led to an empty tomb and a resurrection. I decided to follow the way of living. Before he ended end of his life, Muhammad wrote in the Quran, I don't know where I'm going. In Surah 46.9, Muhammad wrote, I am not something original among the messengers, nor do I know what will be done with me or with you. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am going, there you may be also. The choice is simple, people. Choose the living way. The living way. See, a few years ago, some missionaries, of course, in Bangladesh, they were showing the the Jesus uh, film uh, to several hundred villagers. And the villagers did not know the story of Jesus, so this was all new to them. And they were uh, enthralled with the life of Jesus. But then as the torture and the crucifixion of Jesus ensued, there were tears, there were gasps, and people yelling in response to uh, to the treatment that Jesus was suffering. There was chaos among the crowd as, as Jesus was being tortured. And then suddenly a young man jumps up, screams, don't be afraid. He gets up again. I saw it before. You see, that's the Easter message. I've seen the Lord. He gets up again. Don't be afraid. Muhammad was wrong. Sesame Street was wrong. People do come back and get up after they die. That's why we can sing, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth a living, just because he lives. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, I pray that Each person here knows that you're alive. And my prayer would be that all of us here today will have, or will sometime in the future here, make a decision to say yes to Jesus. To surrender this life that we live here to Jesus. That we might live that we might live, that our tears might be wiped away as only Jesus can do. That our searching can stop because we found Jesus Christ. Not only have we found him though, we have surrendered to him. Father God, I pray for anybody who is searching right now and seeking. May they take the opportunity this morning or sometime soon to say yes to you and be able to sing with us because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, I know who holds the future. And life is worth worth a living because he lives. Father God, thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. In preparing uh, the songs that we would sing today, it was impressed upon me over a lunch that I needed to modify the lyrics of this song. While salvation is a personal matter between you and God, from the instant that you are saved, you are never alone. You are part of the family of God. You have brothers and sisters all over the world. You have a heaven full of brothers and sisters. 
Nobody is a Christian by themselves. We are all the bride of Christ. And so we are here today to declare that we serve a risen Savior. We know that he is alive. We join the church all over today celebrating Christ's resurrection and declaring who our allegiance, our heart, our lives belong to. Let us sing this all together. And now may the living Lord Jesus go with all of you, guiding you and protecting you from this day forward until that day we get to all meet in heaven together. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.